I think the interpretation of the book of Revelation uh, is very dependent on getting the outline of the book correct. And um, I'm arrogant enough to think I have the correct outline. <laughs> I, I, I worried about myself at one point, and I said to one of the professors at Westminster Seminary, California, should I worry that I have my own distinctive outline? And I got the perfect response. The perfect response is everyone has their own outline, so why shouldn't you? Um, but the discussion of the um, of the state, I believe, in Revelation 17 is a part of the discussion of the coming of final judgment on the three great enemies of Christ before the end of the world. And the first is judgment on the state. The second is a judgment on the teachers of false religion, mm -hmm. and then um, a judgment on the devil as the object of worship in false religion. And so the, the state as presented there in Revelation 17, I think, is the state in its worst form. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily the way, um, in, in all of its detail, the state is at every point. In the state, in its worst form, this is just, can it be saved? <laughs> so this, is what, this is what's on everyone's mind right now, right? Um, not everyone, just people who spend a lot of time on social media and don't know what else to do. But Well, our premillennial friends would say, no, the state cannot be saved. Everything will go to bad, from bad to worse. Uh -huh. And then one of the great proponents of that, Jerry Falwell, or started an organization called the Moral Majority. Well, if everything is going from bad to worse, how can there be a moral majority? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it shows the, the difficulty for most Christians of finding a kind of coherent, integrated view of history and the world. Um, some of our post-millennial friends say, nothing can be done with the state now. All we can do is preach the gospel and mm -hmm. wait for the, the day of blessing when so many will be converted. Yeah. The state will Mass be changed conversion by that. Will change. Mass conversion, yeah. which is interesting, exactly what an awful lot of American revivalists have always said. We just have to try to save individuals along the way. And uh, But the revivals didn't accomplish that. Did they not? Wasn't America perfect? <laughs> I mean, that's a fair point, right? At our best point of revival, did it accomplish that? No, no. So th that's a kind of curious form. Uh, and that's why I'm kind of drawn to Abraham Kuyper's vision, not that I think Kuyper was perfect, but um, that Christians need to try to develop a Christian public voice that mm -hmm. will speak to the state, particularly in a democracy where things can be changed, um, and that Christian public voice needs to try to be persuasive, not coercive. We need to try to persuade people that the moral issues mm -hmm. before us um, need to be addressed thoughtfully. And, right. and look at the sort of pathetic state we're in on the issue of abortion. Mm -hmm. the, the churches have been talking, conservative Bible-believing churches have been talking about abortion for 50 years, right. and now suddenly there's an opportunity to try to influence state legislatures on abortion. It seems to me fairly clear. Churches really have not thought this through or reached um, a conclusion on what they want. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do we want to stand— Against every say, <clears throat> excuse me, against every single abortion, uh, in a position that may feel very good for us, but almost certainly will never be adopted, and therefore have no real influence on the number of abortions in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. Or, I, I mean, I can understand the people who want to stand there, but. There is a case to be made for trying to find a position that will actually reduce the number of abortions in this country. Um, and that, you know, and, and then what's recently come up in, in veto fertilization. Um, that's been around and going on for a long time. Apparently, Christians have hardly given any thought to that. Mm -hmm. So we need, we need Christians who are ethicists and theologians and political uh, people to try to put together a, a policy that will maybe change things. And, and Kuyper's great point here is that we need to be committed to reformation, not revolution, mm -hmm. that um, we're not going to bring about a reform, 
a, a revolution in our time to make all things new. That's up to Christ to do when right. he comes again in glory. But for now, we ought to have strategies to try to make things better, to bear a Christian witness, uh, not with the expectation that we're going to be vastly successful. Whatever success we might have, again, will be left up to the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. But um, at least a testimony uh, to uh, what we think the implications of Christianity are for the world in which we live. And Kuiper's point is, not to be coercive in terms of mm -hmm. imposing Christian religion and Christian worship on people, but to articulate what we think um, uh, God would have in various areas of life as, as proper policy, and call on people to support enabling the policy rather than uh, necessarily adopting all of the foundational convictions that have produced this policy. So, you know, the great case in the Netherlands was uh, Christian day schools, mm -hmm. and Kuiper wanted Christian day schools supported by government money uh, for the Reformed community, but he equally wanted it for the Roman Catholic and Jewish communities. So um, that was something that, you know, these other communities could get behind as a goal uh, that arose out of the conviction, the Kuiperian conviction, the Christian conviction— that parents have the responsibility before God to educate their children, mm -hmm. and they need to do that in the truth as they see the truth. And then at the last day, Christ will render judgment who was faithful in educating their children, who wasn't. But the state doesn't have a competence to to make that judgment. And uh, right. so uh, that's just a small yeah. example of how Reformation may, may happen if we had a Christian vision to articulate. In terms of the the revelation's perspective here, um, you know, I don't want to say, I, I don't want to fall into a retreatism. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that mm -hmm. because I think it would be easy to read revelation and say, listen, everything, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> right. What are we to do? Right. You know, just buckle down, stay in our communities and don't engage yeah. the, the culture or yeah. whatever. Yeah. That, yeah. That's not a right approach to this. Right. Um, but I do think it's it's interesting how much attention Revelation, the book of Revelation, gives to judgment mm -hmm. of nations. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it seems to me, if I'm looking at the biblical data, that throughout history, nations and kingdoms run in cycles of iniquity. Right, right. <laughs> and when those cycles are complete, when the iniquity, that, that's always been a fascinating statement to me, when the iniquity of, of the Amorites is complete, then right. I'm going to give you the land. That's um, right. That's right. Um, so I think we're going through a cycle here. I think we can prove that in our own nation from right. its good moral consensus from where we were to now not having that. Right. And, right? you know, th this is kind of an extension of the point that many people have talked about in church history, American church history in particular, about how churches tend to go bad over time. <laughs> right. And right. and the comment is often mad, made that the first generation— um, are the lovers of God, the second generation are the lovers of money, and the third generation are the lovers of pleasure. Mm. So um, That's so true. <laughs> I mean, that's true of families, it's true uh -huh. of, of uh, churches, yeah. but I think it's also true of countries, mm -hmm. maybe not just in three generations. But over time, the virtues that made a country great, whether we measure greatness in terms of military power, economic power, morality, whatever, um, those very virtues produce um, wealth, usually, and strength, not for everybody, but, you know, in general terms. And um, that undermines the very virtues that produce these things. I think you see that in the history of the Roman Empire, but many others as well. And um, so, yeah, we have to be prepared for these cycles to play out, which really are, I think, God's judgments in history. Right. I think one of the things kind of missed is that in the book of the Revelation is that while um, the the book talks about the suffering of the righteous, uh, especially in chapters four through seven. Uh, it then cycles back and talks about the suffering of the wicked in history, mm -hmm. in in chapters eight through uh, middle of eleven. So, um, part of the encouragement given to to uh, Christians, I think, in this time is bear in mind that although you're suffering some. The wicked also suffer in in the judgment of God in 
in history, not right. just at the end. Right. I think that's important. Um, you know, I, I think of the the Revelation eight. You know, um, the, the the prayers ascend to the throne room like smoke into the th- throne room, and then fire comes back down on the earth. Right. And and so God is clearly communicating. He's defending his church. He's defending his people. He's judging. He's judging the nations. He, it, you know, this is all the language out of the Psalms. Right. And he's gathering his elect. He's gathering his elect. In that sense, there is evangelism going on. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I guess, you know, we have to recognize that part of what is happening, and that's why I think we, it's so important to stay focused on the witness that we are called to be faithful witnesses unto death in the midst of all this, because there are things happening, larger spiritual realities happening, um, cosmic warfare happening <laughs> in ways that we're not stopping. Uh, mm-hmm. The Lord is. Mm-hmm. He's the one ultimately responsible to win the battle. Right. <laughs> Which he has won, but in, you know, in the final resurrection, will right. crush the head of Satan finally. And, and he's responsible for how much evil is restrained in any given period in history. Right. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the great lessons of history is that Christians have been able not just to survive, but actually to prosper under almost any kind of political or economic system in the history of the world. It's amazing. Yeah. It's it's under empires, under Mm -hmm. republics, under tyrannies, Mm -hmm. um, under the the most um, abusive of atheistic tyrannies, whether Stalin or Mao, the church has not only been able, or the mullahs in Iran, um, the church has not only been able to survive, but by the blessing of God to grow and prosper. This is a question just came into my head. So if it's not a good one, just, <laughs> just say it. <laughs> it may be one of those good or bad moments. You see the bad ones usually. But um, the, a lot of people will refer to Puritans, reformers, and their political theory. Mm-hmm. And they will say, look at how they handled things. Look at what they believed about the Christian prince and the magistrate Mm -hmm. and what we should be trying to achieve. But wasn't that under the privilege of what you just talked about, um, of Christendom? And it seems to me that we are so, we read all of that back, you know, sort of into our moment, but we're not in the same moment. Does that, does that? No, I think that's exactly right. And Kuiper, I think very insightfully said, others no doubt said it as well, that the reformers' attitude to the magistrate and their attitude toward the relationship of church and state were attitudes they inherited from the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. They were not reformed insights. And um, so Kuiper observed that um, they really hadn't thought, rethought all of these issues in reforming biblical ways, they had just taken what they had inherited. Mm -hmm. And with all the other things they had to do in terms of reforming worship, reforming um, doctrine, reforming the life of Christian people, they may not have thought as clearly about these things, just accepted what had always been for centuries the attitude in the West, namely that church and state should be allied, that the state should enforce a sound mm-hmm. doctrine. Mm-hmm. And um, right, right. Um, so didn't, wh- whereas I think Kuiper would have said that the challenge posed by the spirit of the French Revolution in the eight, late 18th century and the growing secularism of Europe in the 19th century made Christians rethink, um, was this alliance of church and state actually a good thing mm-hmm. for either the state or the church? Um, it may have been better for the state than it was for the church, frankly. Um, mm-hmm. the, the state derived a lot of moral stability and, and a kind of vision from the church. But the church was compromised in terms of freedom to exercise discipline, freedom to criticize the state, uh, all sorts of areas, um, dependence on the state financially. So yeah. um, I think Kuiper is right to say um, it was really in the 19th century we were able to go back and more clearly take a look at this question, what should the state be doing? Although there were earlier voices, Oliver Cromwell was mm-hmm. uh, concerned about coercion in the matter of religion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, read, I was reading Musculus the other day. <laughs> and the way he articulated things for us, for me, is shocking. Mm. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's right. It was borrowed from what he just assumed. But we're in it. We are in. Th- 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 it's sort of simplistic to me because I hear this all the time. That's always thrown into this discussion of how unfaithful we are being because we're not being like them in the way that they adopted political theory. And I think that doesn't take into into you know context our context well the complexities that we are in and how best we are to think through it, particularly in the given situation we are, which is more like the early church. So, exactly. Um, exactly. They didn't have that liberty. <laughs> right, right. So. But even more than that, if suddenly um, we saw a great revival mm-hmm. and uh, we were able to elect uh, wonderfully reformed um, politicians who would actually control the Supreme Court and the White House and the Senate and the House of Representatives, um, would we want to close down all churches in America except reform churches? Right. Right. Who who gets the pass? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who who gets the pass? And uh now you could I'm sure some people will argue, well, that's just because you've become secularized, you've become taken over by the spirit of the modern age. But I I think it's a hard case to make that Christ would be glorified in um closing down all other churches except ours, and then, logically, forcing everybody to go to church. Um, I mean, Calvin tried uh, that—not Calvin, but the the city council in Geneva tried that, and and people went and made rude noises in church (laughs) because they didn't want to be there. They didn't want to be there. And um, have you really gained what you want to gain Mm -hmm. by by forcing people— to leave the church they want to go to and go to the church you think they ought to go to. And, um, right. I mean, I'm willing to talk about these things, but I, yeah. it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't breathe to me the spirit of Jesus who, right. Right. um, wanted people to be convinced to follow him. Mm-hmm. Right. Did we conquer the book of Revelation? <laughs> Absolutely. We solved every single problem. <laughs> I don't think there's anything else. We really didn't get to, to the, the, the last book in, the, ba- the back end of the, the new, new heavens and the new earth. And um, Do you want me to explain what's critical about Revelation 20? Sure. In two minutes? For, yes, that'd be good. Uh, how about two minutes of Revelation 20? Well, I think what most interpreters miss in coming to Revelation 20 is that for the first time in the book of the Revelation, you have a long period of time mentioned. The longest period of time, I think I'm right about this, before in the book of the Revelation is three and a half years. Everything is soon. Everything is sudden. Everything is short, 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 short. Um, I, I, you know, heard silence in heaven for the mm-hmm. space of half an hour. Yeah. Everything is short. And then all of a sudden you get to chapter 20 and you have a thousand years. How, how does this tie into all the shortness, all the soonness mm-hmm. that's been emphasized right. in the book of the Revelation? And I just don't see interpreters taking that seriously enough. Maybe it's just because they're pious and they <laughs> whatever comes in the Bible, they just take. But I think we should be shocked about this. Um, Why this long period at the, at, yeah, at the end of the book? At the, yeah, nearing, nearing the end of the book. And... Um, standing in such contrast with everything else we've seen in the book. Mm -hmm. And I think the point here is because everything in the book of the Revelation is symbolic, and people who don't get that really miss most of what's going on. It's a strong statement for people. They do not not like that. I know. I know. (laughs) But when they turn the the scorpion tails into helicopters, they have proven our point (laughs) that it's symbolic. Um, Or a literal chain around Satan's neck. Yeah, uh, um, I think I heard John MacArthur say that. So, <laughs> well, I'm too nice to attack John MacArthur. <laughs> I'm not attacking. I heard him say it. I think it's uh, the genre of the book's important. Yes, yes. So, what what is the point here? The point here is, I think, to say to Christians, um, God is giving you responsibility to be faithful to Him. And you have plenty of time for your responsibility. Mm. I, I, I thought of that what, um, in relation to a wonderful biography of Mary Slessor. Uh, Mary Slessor was one of the most famous missionaries to come out of Scotland, went to 
uh, what's today Nigeria. And uh, um, she, she was used by the Lord to, to do a great work amongst, you know, cannibals and uh, very, very different circumstance, circumstances. Male missionaries wouldn't go into this mm-hmm. region because it was so dangerous. Mm-hmm. And she went just sort of on her own. And um, uh, one of the things she said, which has always stuck with me, is Jesus was never in a hurry. And and I think um, Revelation 20 is fundamentally saying, Christian, you don't need to be in a hurry. You don't need to worry. You don't need to fret. You don't need to rush around. Um, God's giving you plenty of time to accomplish the tasks that he wants you to accomplish, which is to be faithful. Right. Um, and um, Satan's not going to be able to deceive the nations anymore. That means that the work of the gospel mm-hmm. will go to the ends of the earth. So I, I, I think it's meant to be part of that encouragement. It's not to be the source of a debate about what's going to happen a long time in the future. In in a real sense, I think here the all millennialists are exactly right. Mm-hmm. The millennium has begun. Satan is chained. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not to say he isn't also right. causing great havoc, but he's not able to deceive the nations as he once was. Mm-hmm. And we have time to to see that working out. What about that short period? when he's able to do that. <laughs> well, I have a radical view. Of it. I don't know if you really want a radical view. I think the short period is the same as the long period. Oh, interesting. Um, that, yeah, at the same time he's chained and we have a long period to deceive the nations. It's also true that he's furious and running around seeing who can, he can, be, he can deceive. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that may not be right. There may be yeah. a, a worsening at the end. Mm-hmm. But I think the scriptural evidence that there's going to be a general worsening, worsening at the end is pretty limited myself. Yeah. Um, I think that helps, especially to remember that Revelation's not giving us a chronological order. It's capturing snapshots of history, really. Right. And from heavenly perspective, right? right in, exactly. In a pop apocalyptic, sorry, it's like you saying post-millennial um, <laughs> genre, um, for us to help us with that. So that's those periods like the half hour, um, that has its own peculiar purpose right? to encourage us in its own way, whereas Revelation 20, you're saying, gives us a different perspective on that. Right. Yeah, I, I, I preach I had a, what I thought was a good sermon on Revelation <laughs> 8, 1, and uh, I, I've said to people, have you ever been in a hospital waiting room silent for half an hour? <laughs> How long does that feel? Yeah, exactly. How long does that feel? So yeah. it feels that the Lord is delaying greatly when he really isn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. When the minutes turned to hours, was that Gordon Lightfoot? Anyways. Well, and um, yeah, but also very importantly with Steve Baugh, said uh, about time in the last days, Mm -hmm. that in 1 John 2, John says, we're in the last hour. Right. So, you know, last days, last hours, for us, it's 2,000 years, but um, from the Lord's point of view, it's a a short time. Right. Okay. Very helpful. Oh, well, I hope so. Thanks. Thanks for coming on Read the book of the Revelation. And and so they can pick up your study at Ligonier. There's the audio lectures at Ligonier, and And, then also a booklet. And video. And and video, and video, yeah. and then a book, too. Right, I think so. Yeah, uh, I think I at, saw that. At Ligonier.org. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Bob, for being on the program. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks.